It's hard to imagine any discussion of exascale computing or exaflops levels of computation without a discussion of Cray. We're fortunate to be here today for an exclusive feature interview for the Exascale Report with the CEO of Cray, Peter Ungaro. So Pete, thanks for joining us today for this report. Absolutely. Uh, let's start off with a reality check, should we? So everybody's talking about having an exascale or exaflop system ready by the year 2018. Is, is that possible? What do you think? Are we going to hit that? Mike, I think it's absolutely achievable. Um, I, I think a lot of the bigger questions are going to be in 2018, what's going to be the cost of the system and what's going to be the uh, real performance of the system and how usable will that system be. I think those are really the big questions because 2018 is obviously much quicker than the market would demand uh, that type of system. But uh, is it achievable with the technology and everything? I think absolutely. I think the bigger question is, are the budgets going to be there to be able to accelerate that at that kind of pace? Okay, so that's, uh, that really does make a lot of sense from everything that we've heard. But even if that goal is achievable, should we be trying to achieve it? I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if this question has come up with you before, but why not take a gentler slope into this intense innovation? And are we sacrificing some of the things that we could be doing, uh, you know, finding a cure for cancer uh, by going off on this quest for exascale so soon and so rapidly? Yeah, to me, this is a really easy question, which is we should do it if we think the payoff is there. Uh, if we think that by investing in bringing forward exascale computing, uh, we can do things like find cures for cancer and solve some of the uh, energy problems around the world and protect our borders and bring better quality of life to people, uh, build more, in, you know, use exascale computing to build innovation that can drive job growth. Uh, if we believe those things and we believe exascale is the pathway to those things, I think we should absolutely be doing that. Uh, if we don't believe that, then that's another question and then I think uh, maybe that money is better spent in other places. Uh, clearly, if it's my vote, uh, I really believe uh, with you know all my being that Exascale is going to help in those areas. And you know, quite honestly, computing, supercomputing specifically, being able to help in those areas is is what has kept me in this market uh, all this time personally. Uh, is is that promise? And I, I believe computing can do that. So. I really believe it is the right investment for us, but I'm not the one that's going to get the final vote there. Okay, so you believe it's achievable, and you believe it's the right thing to do. Now, you're a public company. You've got shareholders that you're responsible for, <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, you've got to account to these folks, and getting to exascale is going to require a tremendous amount of in innovation and some unbelievable amounts of money that we haven't even started to, to realize at this point. Mm -hmm. So. What's the business model for actually getting to exascale that's going to give a return to your shareholders? Well, we really, uh, you know, I would say this is the, probably the biggest question as a company that we wrestle with all the time, uh, is, you know, can we build a company that's completely focused on the high-end supercomputing marketplace and build a successful business model as a public company uh, where we can, you know, have a, a great customer base, but also return a, our investment to our shareholders and, and make that a good return for them. Uh, we restructured our whole company, in fact, in 2005 around this belief. We uh, really did a gut check at that point in time and said, you know, what way do we got to take this company from an overall business model perspective? A and we believe absolutely that we can build a company around, uh, you know, focused on the very high end. I, I do think it's going to take some different things. Uh, it's a different model working at the high end than it is uh, working in the broader HPC market or th even the broader computing market for that matter. Uh, I think the realities today are quite different and that the model to build these kinds of systems uh, is, is completely different. We're doing things today, for instance, we're working on a DARPA project uh, where they're funding a lot of the R&D. We're kind of co-funding the R&D. Uh, we take that up to a prototype phase, and then Cray can pick it up from there to do productization. Uh, we did a project uh, a few years ago with Sandia to develop the Red Storm system, which ultimately became our XT3 and, and now our current line that we have today, um, you know, where we did a lot of co-design and joint R&D around a system that you know, really wasn't even uh, contemplated at the time and kind of built that system up. 
uh, and co-designed it and co-developed it with Sandy and brought that to market. So I think there is a lot of different models. And because we're a company that's solely focused on this high end, I think we're in a really good position because we're pretty flexible in how we can position ourselves and how we can take advantage of that and what business model we ultimately uh, can use as far as uh, making a good return for our shareholders, a good business for the company, and uh, successful for the customer. So do you see um, a lot more collaborative R&D rather than just pure Cray reaching down to deeper pockets of R&D? Yeah, a absolutely. I think that's another fact of life uh, today is that I don't think that there's any one company that's going to develop the best exascale computer. I don't think that there's barely any country uh, that's going to develop the best exascale computer. I think it has to be a broad collaboration uh, with companies that have different parts of the core technologies, uh, companies like Crave that will look for the technologies to kind of stitch a lot of that core technology together and make it work, and customers that want to participate in that to look at their applications and look at their usage of the machine and how best to kind of enable that. Because I, I think one of the challenges we have in building these very large systems is um, their lifespan doesn't go on for 20 years. Uh, they're you know, really a valuable resource for a short period of time. And so you really need a very, very close collaboration between companies, uh, somebody to pull it all together, and customers in order to make sure that you can get value out of that resource uh, at the start of that resource's life, not five years later. Uh, so that's a different way to, to do things than we've done in the past. Okay. So let's talk about the involvement that you'll have maybe with your customers uh, as opposed to the investors. And what kind of relationships are you going to have to establish in order to pull together all the elements from the collaborative design to the, the parts and everything else that goes into these first levels of exascale systems? Yeah, I think it's a unique relationship. I, I think it's a relationship that doesn't start with uh, somebody saying, we'll pay you, you know, $10 to buy X amount of stuff, I think it's somebody that says we want to sit down and work together and figure out what, how to co-design uh, a machine with you. And at Cray, we really, all of our newest machines we've done in that mode. So I don't think it's a different mode for us as a company working. I think it's going to be quite challenging maybe on other companies that aren't used to working in that mode uh, with customers. But I think it's actually one of the advantages that we have is to be able to just sit down with customers and talk about you know, what's possible, um, what we think makes sense, what they think makes sense, and, and finding that place that works together uh, between Cray and customers be, and with other companies involved, because like we just said, it's going to take a lot more than just Cray or any one company uh, to make this successful. And today, are you already working with some customers in terms of Exascale? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I would <laughs> say, you know, if you think about kind of uh, where our, our development efforts are right now, it's really all thinking about that. I mean, we got, obviously, current programs that we're bringing to market over the next year or two. Uh, but really, after this next stage of products that we have, and really this DARPA project that we call Cascade, uh, is kind of the culmination of a lot of that. Uh, post that time, we're really all into exascale and uh, what's going to how systems are going to build up ultimately into that system. And so we've really started to spend a lot of time uh, with customers here in the U.S., with customers abroad in Europe, around the world, and with a lot of companies. We have partnered with a number of companies. Um, through uh, other programs that we've been doing, as well as things working their way up through Exascale. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we have quite a group of people, and I expect more will happen over you know, the course of the next few years. So working with your, your customers and your partners and so forth globally, um, mm -hmm. let's, let's hit that topic just for a second. There seems to be so much development effort related to Exascale that's, that's, that's taking place in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of announcements there, particularly you know, Intel 3 Labs and so forth. What's the deal? Why Europe? Uh, Europe really is a, it was an easy decision for us. We uh, launched the uh, you know, Cray X-Scale program in Europe in 2000, early 2009. And uh, really for us, it was the recollection of you know, Europe becoming a much bigger part of Cray overall, of our business and our customer base, of the incredible talent that they have in Europe. But most importantly, I think Europe was one of the first countries through programs like Trace to really get organized around starting to build a program like that. 
Uh, I think that they were, you know, way before, you know, the U.S. even in, in organizing themselves uh, and starting to think about what's going to happen in the exascale era and, and such. And, you know, it's very attractive to be working with, uh, with countries like that. So it, it's, uh, it's been a great start, and, and that program has already, you know, like I said, been going on for a couple of years now mm -hmm. and is only getting stronger. So I'm pretty excited about it. Do you think the activity in Europe is helping to drive attention toward a national, the need for a national exascale initiative in the U.S.? I, I think that it is a little bit. I think that there's other challenges in, you know, countries like China and Russia and places like that that are also uh, driving that a bit. I think even more, what's more exciting to me is things like the International Exascale Software Project, IESP. Uh, where, you know, because Europe was early to get involved, and, and of course there's, you know, great thinkers here in the U.S. and everywhere else, you know, we now already have a software program that's international in, in, uh, in feel and in, in participation, and Cray, of course, is participating in that quite a bit. So it's starting to really integrate, I think, a lot of the needs and different requirements around the world as well as a lot of the great thinkers around the world all together in this mission to, to get to Exascale. So that's, I think, an exciting thing. So it maybe Europe was first, but I think Europe is also, because they've had to pull so many countries there together across the EU and even broader than that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's also helped to pull the U.S. in and Japan in and China in and India and everybody else. So I think that's yeah. been great. That's so let me throw a curveball at you here. Um, You've probably seen this in some past articles that we've written and some of the interviews that I've done. Where, uh, we've had quite a few people who have said that if they had to guess today, they believe the first exascale system will be fielded in China. What's your thought on that? Well, I think you know China is one of the most interesting things going on right now in the HPC market. If if we go back, you know, I've been around for maybe 20 years in the supercomputing business. Um, you know, it's four or five countries have really driven the majority of that market. China wasn't one of them. And, uh, you know, now we're starting to see huge emphasis in China and country, new countries like Russia that are starting to build major programs. And, and that's a, I think that's a really fundamental shift in the market. I, to me, it's the most exciting thing going on in the marketplace right now is new countries coming into this high-end business. Um, is the first machine going to happen in China or not? I don't know. I, I couldn't make that prediction. Uh, I don't know what the over-under on it is, but what I can say uh, is that I believe that there's going to be multiple countries fielding X-scale machines. I don't believe that there's going to be one or two of them in the world. Uh, I think that there's going to be multiple countries, and I think you know some countries, big countries like the U.S., are going to probably have multiple machines. Um, and, uh, and I think the key, though, is the first exascale machine, you know, wh what's important is not hitting an exa exaflop peak performance. I think what's important is having a machine at that scale that can run real scientific applications, a broad set of them, to solve some of the problems that we talked about earlier. Uh, is China going to be there first for that? I don't know yet. I think that they're a little bit behind other places in that. But I think they also have the most uh, fortitude right now to get there. So it's going to be an interesting run. It's, you know, it's eight years away, uh, so you never know what happens in eight years. That's a long time. So we might see uh, an exascale level benchmark. Somebody hit exascale with a benchmark, but what you're saying is that's not necessarily the real proof point. Could there be a gap of several years between a benchmark hitting exaflops and applications actually taking advantage of it? It can be. Um, you know, I, I personally, is my personal belief, I don't believe hitting an exascale exaflop peak or even with Limpack is really an exaflop supercomputer uh, at the end of the day. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll call it that, and the media will call it that. You guys will write about that, of course, uh, and we'll probably do press releases about that. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think what we really want is we have a set of problems that we need to try and go and attack with this kind of machine mission problems, societal problems that are very important, okay. and the machine that really helps to move that forward, and it's probably a couple of different machines, uh, I think is really when the X-scale era is going to be uh, begin. If, if you look at 
petaflops, when we hit petaflops, I think the first petaflop machine uh, was the IBM Roadrunner machine. Uh, you know, our system that hit a petaflop was about a year or so uh, after that, although that was the first system to, and still the only system in the world today to actually run real applications uh, at a petaflop performance. So mm -hmm. I really think that that's more the important metric overall is running real applications at that level. So, so Pete, there's still a lot of speculation about what exascale machines can or even should look like. Um, what are the major elements of, of Cray's you know, planned exascale architecture, if you will, and as you see them today, what's the gem or the unique value proposition that you believe Cray's going to bring to the table? Yeah, I mean, we could argue for a long time, and it's a great debate. We have lots of debates inside of Cray right now of what the first exascale machine is going to look like or what the best exascale machine would look like. And at the end of the day, I would say I don't think anybody really can predict all of those technologies still yet today that are going to be really needed in that first machine. I think that there's still a lot of discovery that needs to happen. Uh, one thing is clear is that it is going to be at unprecedented scale. And scalability is something that I think, you know, more than probably any other company on the planet, uh, we do well. We think about scale before we even get up with engineers on a whiteboard and start to think about designs of machines. And I, I think that that is something that, as a company, uh, we're going to really wrestle with and something that I think we do really, really well is to think about, you know, what topologies are, are applicable at scale and, and what, you know, interconnect needs are and what kind of, um, you know, how do you scale applications and what compilers and tools and libraries and how do you scale the operating system and the s even just simple things like the heartbeat of the machine at scale is, is quite different. Uh, when you're building machines at this kind of scale. And we learned about that a lot when we built the petaflops machine, I think. We, you know, we learned a lot of the technologies that clusters use very successfully today break down at scale. And so mm -hmm. scale is something that's incredibly important. But I, I would say, and I think we do as well, if not better than anyone else out there, but if you ask me what we think that our real gem is, I'd say we have an entire company 100% focused on building the best supercomputers in the world. And at the end of the day, um, that I think is the thing that differentiates Cray and makes Cray an incredibly special company in the marketplace, uh, is because we are the only company that's, that's done that, that said, you know, we're going to take a whole company, we're going to focus it on one marketplace, and we're going to go try and do that better than anyone else can do. And, uh, and that's, I think, at the end of the day, what's really different about Cray. Because even, forget about the technology or the, um, the systems, but even the way that you service customers that are building, you know, that are, are running machines at extreme scale changes. Uh, you know, everything changes. And market, in my mind, we used to talk a lot about how uh, we build these big machines at the high end of the market, and a couple years later, they'd start to make their way down. Uh, it's not that way anymore. The market at the high end is bifurcated from the rest of the high performance computing market. To me, it's almost like it's two completely different markets. And we've really built a company, I think, that's, that's focused on that very high end and has been you know, very successful at that. So I think that's the real gem of Cray. So you guys understand scaling, if not better than, as good as, anybody can understand it. You've got a long, rich, successful history of collaborative R&D, which mm -hmm. is going to obviously help in this regard. Um, it sounds like you're saying you could build an exascale system today if money were not an object and if power <laughs> were not a restricting factor to it. Power may be even more important if you want to talk about it today. <laughs> so, you know, how do you how do you get there? Um, you know, is is this going to require uh, an approach that's completely revolutionary, or are you on the side the folks that say this is an evolutionary approach? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a bit of both, uh, but I think it's going to be more evolutionary than revolutionary, uh, because if it isn't, uh, I think the problem is going to be is that if we have to design completely new systems and completely new operating systems and completely new programming models, and I think the applications won't be ready to take advantage of that machine for five or ten years, and and I think then the value of 
pulling that machine forward in time is going to really lose a lot of, you're not going to get that value out of it. Going back to the first question, you know, early question that you asked me about, you know, is it worth, to, you know, pulling it forward? Uh, so I do think that there is going to be some revolutionary technologies, though, uh, and we talked about power. I think power is one of those areas that we're going to need some pretty revolutionary technologies uh, in order to mm -hmm. kind of cope with, you know, the power requirements of the system. I mean, today you have some of the largest data centers in the world are, are north of 100 megawatts, but a single system north of 100 megawatts is probably not affordable to run. And so how do we get that down by a third or a quarter or a fifth of that number? Uh, I think is going to take some pretty exciting and different, you know, revolutionary mm -hmm. technology. So I do think it's a combination, but I think from a user perspective, the system has to look more evolutionary than revolutionary mm -hmm. uh, in order to be effective and really get the payback that you need out of the machines. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's an investment and the investment has to pay off just like any other investment. And I think that really pushes us towards more the evolutionary side. Let me ask you, as, as one of our industry's true thought leaders, what advice, what words of wisdom do you have for the community that might help steer us toward achieving the goal of exascale computing by the year 2018? You know, I think the biggest thing that I would throw out to the community, to, I don't know if I call it words of wisdom, I, I think what I would really think as a community we need to do I is to state the need. We, we need to really show people why a supercomputer, why an exascale supercomputer is so important why having it in 2018 is fundamentally different than having it in 2021 or 2025 or whenever it may come more naturally into the marketplace. Uh, I really believe that if we can come together as a community and, and make that case strong, we'll build up our own personal views about achieving that and we will achieve the goal. Uh, I, I think whatever, if the community could all rally around a single goal and have good solid reasons of why they want to do that and why that that goal is so important. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, we're going to achieve it and be very successful, uh, not just with the first exascale machine, but with what I'll call the whole exascale era and taking advantage of these systems and solving some of the problems that we talked about earlier. So uh, I think really that's the biggest challenge. I don't think it's technology. Uh, I don't think ultimately it's money because I think if you really can state the case and the need enough, I think people will understand uh, that the dollars uh, make a lot of sense and they're, they're not the huge amounts of money, but the payback there is very strong. So that's, uh, that would be my words of wisdom. So a lot of the uh, computational scientists that are coming through the, the ranks of school today, through the education system today, eight, nine years from now are going to be working on exascale systems. <laughs> what advice do you have for them? Uh, I really would say that, um, you know, uh, we have to have people that, that start to think about um, using these large machines in new and, and different ways. And uh, it's been kind of interesting for us because uh, we've been able to, you know, use our machines and, and kind of uh, build technologies into our systems that allow them to be used in some very different ways. Uh, for instance, we have this system that's a massively multi-threaded processor that we basically inserted right into the infrastructure of our XT and XE systems uh, that we call the XMT. And there was just recently a, a great piece of work in looking at Twitter data uh, with the system of this. And there's all this whole new area of analytics uh, and graph-based analytics that is starting to be very, very popular. And all of these things can really take advantage of these large machines. And I think one of the things that we see a lot with newer uh, you know, recruits that we, even people coming into Cray, I is that they're not thinking big enough. They're not thinking about how to really take advantage of these systems and what you can really do with these kinds of machines. So I just encourage them to think big and not think about what they can do on their desktop or what they can do in a small cluster that's in their department at a, at a university. Uh, but really think about how these kinds of systems can fundamentally change uh, big parts of how, how the world you know, works 
and and solving some of the big problems of the world because uh, I do believe that the capability is there. I think that we just need a lot more people thinking about it.